This video tutorial is intended for informational purposes only. If you modify your hardware as I have depicted in this video, you are doing so at your own risk. I am not responsible for any damages that may result from performing these modifications. Hey everyone, I'm Kyle, and welcome back to my channel. A few days ago, I dropped my iPod Classic on the ground in the parking lot just outside my apartment building. This unfortunately put a pretty noticeable dent in the upper left corner of the device. What's worse is that my iPod now no longer even boots up, let alone play any music. Fortunately, this is a very easy fix for my iPod. My iPod is a little bit different than most, and it doesn't have a hard drive inside it like most other iPods. Hi there, I'm Kyle, and I'm a 20-something living in northern Kentucky, just south of Cincinnati, Ohio. I like to do lots of fun things. Some of them are a little crazier than others, but I also enjoy building cool stuff in my spare time, and I love traveling to and exploring all sorts of neat and interesting places. So this is my life. Welcome to my channel, and thank you for being here. If you would prefer to skip this backstory and go straight to the tutorial and teardown part of this video, I've included a link in the description below with a timestamp on it that will take you right there. Before flash storage technology, there were hard disk drives, or called hard drives for short, which store data much like CDs and records do. Inside of these drives, data is mechanically written to and read from a spinning platter. 20 years ago, this was the most efficient way of storing data on computers and electronic devices. However, today most of the electronic devices that we use on a daily basis utilize what's called flash storage technology, which stores data electronically on a microchip. To put it simply and without going into too much detail, because of the latency of the mechanical components inside of hard disk drives, read and write speeds of flash storage devices are far superior. Today, Apple's iPod Touch and iPhone devices utilize flash storage technology. However, before flash storage technology became the optimal storage medium of today's world, Apple was sticking actual tiny hard disk drives inside of their iPod devices. These miniature hard drives were developed by Toshiba, with the largest capacity drive in this small form factor ever produced only being about 160 gigabytes in size. The problem with these iPod hard drives is that by today's standards, they are slow and somewhat finicky. And for some people, their capacity is far too small to allow storing an entire music library on. Personally, I like using my iPod in the car. However, if I left it in there on a hot day or in the middle of winter, it would either be too hot or too cold and would not function properly. The battery life was also very short, sometimes only lasting two to three hours on a single charge. This is because along with the backlit screen and the other electronics inside of the iPod, the battery also has to power the motor that spins the hard drive. Enter the iFlash. This amazing little device allows you to utilize flash storage technology inside of your original iPod Classic or iPod Video devices. In doing so, it also allows for greatly improved battery life, which can be somewhere in the 15 to 30 hour life range on a single charge. It also drastically improves the speed of your iPod, and a song can begin playing almost instantly upon selecting it. Another reason that this innovation is so great is because not everybody loves the new iPod Touch or iPhone for listening to music. And in my humble opinion, the audio fidelity of these original iPods is far superior to that of the technology that can be found in Apple's newer touchscreen music players. Now whether this limitation is caused by hardware or software, I have no idea. What I do know is that a few months ago when I tried to use an iPhone 5C as a music playing device, I absolutely hated the iOS touch interface as well as the audio quality coming from the device. Now getting back to the iFlash, I ordered my device, the iFlash Solo, from the iFlash website. On their site, they sell a wide variety of these storage adapter devices, with their most extravagant option allowing a storage upgrade of up to one terabyte of storage space. So for the scope of this video, I will only be focusing on the sixth generation iPod Classic with the iFlash Solo adapter device. However, I've put a link in the description below to the iFlash website, so feel free to check them out for schematics and details on their many other awesome products. It's finally time to begin the teardown process and open up the iPod, but first there's some tools that you'll need. You can find all of the necessary tools for this project on the iFlash website via the link in the description below. I would like to thank my friend Andy for letting me borrow some of his tools for this project, so I've included a link to his channel 
in the art in the description as well. And now it's finally time to dig in, so let's get started. Here are the tools that you'll need. A metal spudger tool, a thin plastic spudger, and a pair of needle nose pliers. I'd also recommend using a pair of thin metal tweezers for this teardown process. They're not technically required to get the device apart, but they do make it a great deal easier. And of course, please also make sure that you purchased the appropriate storage media for your model of iFlash. For me, it was a 32GB Class 10 Lexar brand SD card, which you can find in most stores or online. As you can see, my iPod is just stuck at this screen and won't load the operating system, which leads me to believe that the SD card installed in the iFlash was bumped loose when it fell on the ground. The device also cannot be turned off. I tried every conceivable button combination I could think of to make it power off, but the best I could do was get it to just restart. So it looks like it's going to stay on until we can unplug the battery once we open up the case. Here you see me take the thin tweezers to the side of the iPod. This helps pop loose some of the security clasps holding the front and back of the shell together. After I get some space in there, I take my metal spudger to the gap and use it to separate the rest of the metal clasps that are holding together the right side. Please keep in mind that my iPod has been apart several times before, so this process is a little easier the fourth or fifth time around than the first, so just be aware that this may take you a little longer to do than it did for me. Now take a close look at the bottom here. This is one of the security clasps that I was talking about. This one was bent upwards and is now hanging onto the front part of the device. This is a mistake on my part, because I could have put my metal spudger in there and released it in the first place. Don't worry though, these are made of a very tough metal that can be bent back down with some pliers. However, I wouldn't recommend taking apart your iPod too many times, for fear of these snapping off. And once you get all of the clasps released, the two halves come apart pretty easily. Just be careful not to damage the still connected ribbon cables that are running from the front to the back of the unit. Here I use my tweezers to disconnect the ribbon cable for the battery. Doing so will make the iPod finally power off. Remember to be extremely gentle when handling these ribbon cables. One wrong move and you'll tear them in half. After that's done, you should be able to open up your device like this. Remember to still be careful though, as there is still another ribbon cable connected between the two halves. You should recognize this part from earlier. It's the iFlash. And thankfully, I was right. The SD card did come unseated. So let's just pop that back in. Now, it should boot up normally. Just for reference, here is the original 80GB hard drive that was installed in my iPod Classic. And here is what the iPod looked like with that drive installed in it. Now let's put everything back together. I begin this part of the process by reseating the ribbon cable plugged into the iFlash module. Be sure to set the end of the ribbon fully into the slot on the iFlash, and then press down on the brown clamp to secure the connection. After that, I use my tweezers to pull up on the brown tab on the connector that the ribbon cable for the battery plugs into. This opens up the connector so that the ribbon cable can be inserted more easily. Then just bring the two halves of the iPod together so that the cable can reach, plug it in, and then push down on the brown tab of the connector in order to make a secure connection. You'll also notice that I bent back down the two tabs that I accidentally bent upright before when I was pulling apart the case. To do this, I clamped down on them with the needle nose pliers until they were almost completely flat. Now, just bring the two halves of the iPod together and push the front face into the back housing. You should hear some clicks as the clips pop back into place to secure the two pieces together again. Then all you have to do is press down on the edges to make sure you didn't miss any spots. Please note that if you are installing the iFlash and storage media for the first time, my media being the SD card, 
Then once you power on your iPod again, you should be prompted to restore your iPod from the iTunes app on your computer. This restore will go just the same as when your iPod had a traditional hard drive inside it. My iPod Classic has the Rockbox OS installed on it, so it boots up and runs a little bit differently than a stock iPod. Anyways, just do some testing, like pressing the buttons to make sure they all work, and loading and listening to some music. And you're all set! You now know how to install an iFlash module in your iPod Classic or iPod Video. In conclusion, if you own an iPod Classic or iPod Video media player device, I would highly recommend this modification. I have discovered newfound love for my iPod Classic, and now I use it all the time. That's also thanks in part to the Rockbox OS that I've installed in place of the traditional OS on my iPod Classic. Rockbox has been around for a long time since Apple began releasing and developing the iPod back in the early 2000s. One of the reasons that I love the Rockbox OS so much is that it frees you from needing to use iTunes to load music onto your iPod. You can now effortlessly move MP3s and other formats of audio files to and from your iPod without the need of using iTunes or any other proprietary software. Now, there are many other tutorials online, as well as the ones on the Rockbox website, that show you how to install the Rockbox OS onto your iPod. So I will also put a link to the Rockbox website in the description as well. Also something to note too is that installing Rockbox is not dependent on you having a flash device installed in your iPod. Even if you have a hard drive installed in your iPod, you can install Rockbox anyways. At any rate, if you would like to see me make a Rockbox installation tutorial, feel free to let me know in the comments section below. Leave a like on this video if you liked it, or a dislike if you disliked it for some reason. Also, feel free to leave a comment if you have any questions or if you'd like to tell me something. I want to thank you all again so much for watching my videos, and I'll see you all again in the next one. The battery life for the device with the hard drive in it was also very short. The ice cream truck is driving by.